Hey guys, it's Nick. Welcome to another episode of T-365. Today's episode, I'm going to be showcasing a new enablement guide or updates to an enablement guide that I've made that maps Microsoft security recommendations to the CIS controls. And so part of the guide that I have by popular demand was just mapping each individual control and subsequent safeguard to a Microsoft security recommendation. And with that, I'm going through and providing you what offering that's part of, as in the suite offering, whether that's Intune, Entre ID, SharePoint, et cetera, showing you the end user impact by level, the licensing considerations, and then the IG1 through IG3 designations. So we're gonna be unpacking more of that today and just holistically what it means to have better security with Microsoft, with the CIS controls in mind. But as you can see, I go through each individual offering as separate tabs as well too, just so you can see those. And you can ultimately use this as a gap analysis for your customers as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. Okay guys, so getting into it here, we're gonna to talk today about what it means to be secure by default. And with that, we obviously have certain protections that come with Microsoft out of the box that do layer on some security. If you think about in the Exchange side of the house, we have Exchange Online Protection, which includes some base level policies. But then on the Entra or Azure AD side of the house, we also have something called Security Defaults, which does enable things like multi-factor authentication by default in the tenant. But there's so many different considerations. You know, when we talk about this, as far as the overall best practice guide or your checklist for security, number one, because it will vary by customer in a lot of use cases. We have to do certain whitelisting or we have to make sure that we're accommodating for certain workflows in the organization. But then additionally, on the other side of the house, Microsoft is constantly changing the environment for us as well too. They're introducing new security features or they're moving where things used to be and that's confusing for us as well too or things just evolve over time. If we think about something like multi-factor authentication in Microsoft, this is now getting to be kind of a nightmare in the sense of the various different ways that it can be enabled and how it's been evolving over time between the per user MFA, security defaults, and conditional access policies. So there's that aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it is that obviously the landscape as a whole changes. So new attack vectors, uh, new attack methods, those types of things as well too. So we constantly have to evolve. So this is the reason why I wanted to create a guide specifically behind this. And I wanted to pair it to the CIS controls because when we talk about the security controls, of Microsoft and basically all the best practices that we have, it's so large. You know, your, your footprint of the things that you can do is very much large. It's very impactful in a lot of cases to end users. So it's not like you can just flip the switch. And CIS is great in this that it gives us a prioritization matrix basically for the things that we're trying to do, but also maps it to kind of some core standards uh, from a security perspective. Now I say that in knowing that if you're fully modern, a lot of the security controls or CIS controls, I should say, and subsequent safeguards are not necessarily going to be as modern as you know thinking about a deployment where you don't have a firewall, you're le leveraging Microsoft Intune for MDM for device management. So things are rapidly shifting and I've kind of mapped the Microsoft controls to have this in more of a modern environment. It's not to say that you still can't be running local Active Directory with a domain controller, but it's assuming that we're moving away from traditional firewalls, traditional aspects, um, you know, like having a server spun up on-prem versus having that in Azure, even if you're running domain services in Azure. So with this, when we talk about you know, the, the core concepts as far as what's in this guide, one of which uh, to start off with here is just a policy definition. And that is basically just to say, this is more binary in that when we define this policy, we can say, are we meeting this or are we not? And if we're not, we could give justification reasons. We could say we're using a third party, uh, but we could also just have some clarity on what this exactly means if we're hitting the standard or not to give that checkbox. So that's one of the first things I defined in there with the CIS controls saying something like MFA is required for all users. You know, that, that is something that you either have in place 
or you don't have in place. And if you do have it in place, you may have some exclusions and those should be documented. So this is just getting into kind of the, the fundamental offering as far as the policy goes. The next thing you know, that we're doing is the CIS mapping. So that is to say, I've basically taken some combination of not only the CIS benchmark for Microsoft 365, but they lack a lot of uh, security features when it comes to suite offerings like Intune, for instance. So I kind of filled in the gaps there as far as mapping what I believe to be best security practice uh, to what the CIS controls were. And again, some of this, I had to do a lot of heavy thinking around it just because it's not as modern when we talk about the existing security controls for CIS. But again, one of the things here from the CIS mappings perspective is we only have so much time, we only have the ability to do so much at our MSP or as an IT pro if you're working at an enterprise. So with the CIS mapping, you have your IG1 through IG3 recommendations or uh, configurations there that you would associate to these controls and that gives you a sense of priority. Is this something, if it's IG1, is this something that we should do blanketed for all of our customers versus IG3? This is something we have to work up towards um, over time. So a common example of this, if we think about application management in Microsoft, we have the concepts of just cataloging apps and reviewing them with the enterprise apps that are in Microsoft's Azure AD or Entre ID as it's now known. Then if you think about the next step up from there from the standpoint of you know, centralizing access control and those types of things, you may start to get into something like SSO uh, for applications as well. And then when you get to a higher standard of, of maturity or levels there, you can look into skim provisioning. So this is the automated provisioning that you can do with your applications with the skim package to automatically provision or deprovision or update users across third-party tools. And so this is kind of a progression that you could have, you know, just looking at, hey, I have a catalog that users can click from, from applications, it's my corporate approved apps. Now I have single sign-on applications that users can leverage for accessing them with their Microsoft credentials. I'm centralizing identity, I'm extending security from identity out to these other applications. And then with Skim, I'm also um, not only automating access control management, uh, but I'm also additionally looking at how can I better secure um, just general changes from, from that day to day as well. So all of this is kind of a general concept. You could go into just specifically app discovery as well, where you're manually cataloging these enterprise applications, maybe in a spreadsheet, something like that, versus an IG3, which is, would be like an active or passive um, asset discovery tool like uh, Defender for Cloud Apps. Now this is getting into something where, you know, you're, this is definitely not a common skew, I would say, in the SMB space or anything like that, but it does do automated application discovery. It has some prerequisites, obviously, with, you know, layering in network monitoring uh, or integrating with Defender for Business, but it can discover and actually classify applications for you as well, too, and you can sanction them or unsanction them. So it's a level of security here that, a lot of people aren't gonna be doing out of the box, but you could progress into that um, with additional controls there as well too. So all this you know, kind of flows into the CIS mappings again. I like that because it gives us a sense of priority on the things that we should be doing. We can filter out for IG1s, to make sure all those are complete in our customer environments, and work on another phase for uh, the IG2, IG3. So the other things that we're looking for here is the licensing considerations. So this is a big deal. I think a lot of times people give you blanket level security recommendations, but oftentimes, especially with Microsoft recommended, it's geared towards enterprise licensing. So you'll find in a lot of cases you either have limitations or you can't do it at all. You spend a lot of time kind of sifting through to even see if it's possible or not. Now luckily some other people in the industry or community I should say have built something like the maps reference where we can look at individual security settings or controls or features with our licensing. But this is kind of twofold here because we have the consideration of, um, you know, number one, OK, 
Can we perform? So saying basically, can you perform that security action? Uh, number two uh, is, is this an upsell or cross-sell opportunity for us? And then number three, if you think about the inverse of this, is to say that, um, you know, is this something we, are, we have but we're not using? So this is kind of turning it on its head and saying, okay, well, we actually do have this licensing. I didn't even know that this security recommendation was possible for us to do. And I think the best example I can give of this is people who are subscribed to Microsoft uh, Business Premium has a lot of security features that a lot of people don't know about or they don't implement, one of which is Defender for Business, which is Microsoft's uh, like lightweight version of Defender for Endpoint, which is a EDR solution as well too for your devices. It also does vulnerability scanning for applications as well, and I think it's real underdopted. Now, some of that's warranted because you have trusted third-party EDR solutions in place, or you don't like the lack of uh, management capabilities such as the multi-tenancy concepts there as well too. But this is also something that they're funneling into Microsoft Lighthouse for that purpose. Know that it's not fully robust uh, to that extent yet, um, but it is something to keep into consideration. So regardless of all that, licensing is in the guide just because you need to know if you're capable of doing that or not, and that's not always clear. Um, the next thing here is end user notifications. So with all of these, again, we can't just flip the switch on the security recommendations that we have and those types of things. So we need a way to basically project manage this and roll this out to our end users and make sure they have proper communications because as we all know, Change is terrible for most people, and it doesn't matter if it's you know an industry that's more behind the times, like a manufacturing company, I, I think, that's my personal experience, versus a more progressive company. Everybody hates change, and if you turn something on that blocks their workflows or disrupts their workday, they get really aggravated, as we all know. So the end user notifications, um, you know, I, I like to think about not only the messaging that we want to have, but also thinking about the user impact as part of that as well too. So if we build like a simple matrix here to determine which security controls we want to go implement, we may look at something here like the x-axis being complexity and the y-axis being impact. And so basically, you know, we could say this is low, this is high, this is high here. And so if the complexity is high and the user impact is high, it's likely a security control you might not do right away. Um, but again, you have to measure that kind of against a tertiary layer, which is how big of a security impact is it also making? I would consider the um, MFA deployment as a common example because it's often very disruptive to end users. That's why it still hasn't been 100% adopted in a lot of use cases, especially in SMB. But it's a security blanket that reaches a really far length as far as you know, blocking phishing attacks, um, stopping a lot of uh, you know, initial access if we're talking about MITRE techniques, those types of things too. But if you say, okay, the complexity is low and the user impact low, well, then why don't we go just implement that quickly, you know, and have some small wins, share that with their organization, talk about how it's protecting them more, and then funnel that into some of the other considerations here. If the complexity is low, but the end user impact is still high, um, that might be one where you want to plan around that with more of a drip behind the end user communications. So the templates that I have in there, you can white label. They have the ability to put your logo on it and they're just geared for each security control. And I try to do that with a lot of them. It's probably about 50 in total um, for some of the largest hitting um, or widespread issues is there as well. Not all of the security controls that I recommend do have 
um, end user impact, right? There, some of them are just you know monitoring and op around operations as well too, because it's a better security practice. So then from here, um, the only other considerations that we have as far as uh, what's in the guide is PowerShell scripts. So with all of this, you know, and I like to think about automating as much as we can, especially when you're trying to do these turnkey or just having PowerShell scripts to report on the security. So you have even just a further uh, reporting or, or gap analysis around what you need to go do. So I do believe, and I talked about this with Matt Lee last week in our little um, webinar and, and a beard banter as well too, but effectively automation is security because we are making sure that we're not creating any type of human error. It's consistent. We have um, you know, some checks and balances with that that goes beyond just working in the interface as well too. So P PowerShell is both for myself, but also from some of the community as well um, around this. Well, one thing I forgot to touch on is the setup instructions. So pretty straightforward, uh, but sometimes I know it's hard to navigate where to go, you know, to configure these things. And it does change frequently because Microsoft shifts it to different platforms. Great example is their recent consolidation of Microsoft Defender from the Security Compliance Center, you know, and, and shifting everything related to security in that um, as well too. So I think it's good overall, but did cause a lot of change. So setup instructions are in there, and again, that might be Microsoft docs, but it could be third party that are supplementing, you know, maybe more so best practice that they found. Um, you know, some of the things to consider might be for MSPs or SMB. Uh, but all that's in there as well. And then lastly, what I have in here is just the video content. So this is just more enablement content that you can derive as well too. Um, it's from myself in a lot of cases, but it's also from different MVPs out there on YouTube, just kind of showing you how to do these things, or it might be some of the ninja work, you know, from Microsoft directly. So there's a lot of video content out there, and I like to make sure that not only is that helpful, but it's up to date so you can scale these solutions out to a team. You don't want one person to kind of silo this knowledge. And when things change or you have new security recommendations, you obviously want to uh, keep those things in mind as well. So that's everything that's in the guide here. Again, uh, this is something offer up on my website. You can check it out as well too. Um, it is a paid offering. I do uh, charge for it just because it is a lot of time and effort. But by getting it, you do have access to all the updates that I make over time. I send those out to you as well. Um, and it is something that I do feel is uh, very helpful in the sense of just progressing from a security sense as well too. So that's all I had for you today. Definitely check out the guide. Uh, I'll link that below in this video as well. And if you have any questions, comments about security in Microsoft or some of the things that you're doing that you found really well, feel free to comment those below. All right, guys. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.